Hi, my name is Laurie Burrard and I'm a nurse consultant from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. I'd like to introduce to you our special guest for this segment, Dr. Pratik Chowdhury, who is a diabetologist from King's College Hospital in London, UK. Welcome. Hi, well thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks for coming and spending some time with us. Our topic for today is diabetes and technology. And, and obviously, it's been very exciting for people living with diabetes. There's all kinds of new things out there for them to be using to better self-manage. And of course, someone like yourself is very expert at it. But these people end up in hospital. Yeah. And obviously, you know, diabetes isn't managed in an in-hospital setting. So can you tell us some of the new technology that's available so that your colleagues can be aware of what they might be seeing when people are admitted? Sure, and so I think the technologies people might be using when they come into hospital can range from the very simple stuff, like a lot of people use um, advanced meters that give them dose advice. Some people use apps, and it's important to be aware that they're using those things to help dose and guide their diabetes. But I think more and more now we're seeing things like continuous glucose monitors, um, people using those, um, and also insulin pumps. I think those are the two main categories of technology that people come into hospital may be using. Mm -hmm. and, and for our listeners who, who may not be familiar with those two technologies, the continuous glucose monitors are often a small device that the patient might wear on their arm or their stomach and it has a tiny needle that will be under the skin and the, that measures the glucose levels and transmits that reading to a reader or, or often to their phone actually. So a couple things is that you talked about apps and you talked about advanced like uh, dosing. So obviously they're very empowered to do self-care. So coming into hospital, respecting that yeah. and maybe embracing that in terms of helping the patient to continue self-care versus taking them off the regimen and, you know, managing their disease if if they're, you know, able to manage their own, perhaps embrace that. I think that's that's a key thing and it, and a key judgment I guess that the the treating physician or clinician needs to make is, you know, is that patient well enough to make those decisions and if they are, then they will be generally better at doing that than someone on the ward. Um, but they're, they're, if they're unwell enough that they can't do that, I think that's the key um, decision that people need to make. But wherever possible, I think, um, surveys from all around the world say that patients feel really um, scared, actually, when the, that power, their decision-making around their dosing is taken away. And, and if we can empower them and allow them to be in charge of that decision, that goes a long way towards um, making that stay as less troublesome for them as possible. And when we think about some of the information that's stored in there, that can be really helpful for the provider to even understand where this person's at in terms of what their their insulin dosages are, how they correct for you know um, high blood sugars, how they manage their carbohydrates. So there can be valuable information in there that can guide that if the provider is taking over care because yeah. the patient's unwell. The app part of it. So some of that app is separate from the glucose meters for glucose uh, yep. uh, information and there'd be great history in there as well yep. in terms of what's happening. And log books and history so that the treating physician, if you've got someone coming in, you can flick through and find out where, where this person usually sits. Mm -hmm. And so that gives you a feel for if they're still at that level or, or how they're doing related to that. I think that, that information can be really useful in, in understanding um, what their usual glucose levels are. So let's move to, we, you move to continuous glucose monitoring. So I want to help our, um, uh, the, the viewers understand a little bit. So you mentioned glucose, mm -hmm. but we're actually in fact doing something a bit different, right? So when we move to continuous glucose monitoring, we're all used to capillary glucose, yeah. which typically, you know, is in, um, in line completely with a plasma sample of glucose. But there can be a little bit of difference when we're using continuous glucose monitoring in terms of the source being an interstitial fluid glucose versus a capillary glucose. Any words of wisdom around that? So I think I think you raised an, a really important point because um, often when people are in hospital um, and you've got a capillary glucose reading, it's important for the for the clinician to know and also for the patient to be reminded in some sense that it's measuring glucose in the skin. And there can be a delay of between five and 10 minutes sometimes between those readings particularly when the glucose is changing quite a bit. And although uh, most of the devices now have been tested in, you know, in acute sickness and even in intensive care settings, mm -hmm. actually, and they perform quite well, we need to understand that the numbers you're gonna get from a capillary reading are gonna be different to the numbers. You're gonna get maybe 10 or 20% difference between them. It doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And with the sensors, the key thing that you get in addition is you get which way the glucose is going. Uh, yeah. 
So you have to kind of put all those pieces together, yeah. right? So if you have someone who comes in who's using continuous glucose monitoring, obviously we're so used to the standard is you do a capillary glu yeah. glucose. In times of stable glucoses, they're very similar. Sim but when there's times of changing, there's that five to 10 minute lag. Yeah. But if you're actually using that information, then you'll also see, well, that makes sense because it's going up quickly or it's going down, down quickly. Yeah. Do you think that it's advisable that that's what we should do is say, stop using it and let's go back to capillary glucose? I think that's a tricky one. I think um, most hospitals for dosing might recommend still going on a capillary glucose, but if we have this extra information, it, it makes sense to use it. And, and in the acute setting, maybe a conservative way of going forward for this could be um, if the glucose is way out of range on this continuous monitor, you could do a capillary check and then use that to guide decision. If you're comfortable, the person is comfortable that that data is accurate and they're happy using it, you know, I see no reason why that can't be used um, to, to make decisions. One of the challenges, of course, is how do you get that data into our hospital prescribing and data management systems? For example, in, in our hospital, all our finger prick glucoses go straight to a central database. Right. Uh, and so there are sometimes some logistic challenges. Um, interstitial fluid, um, anything about illness, so uh, the reason we're talking about this is people are in hospital, yeah. is there anything we should think about that there might be something affecting the, um, the amount or the quality of interstitial fluid when people come in, like if they're hypotensive or if they're hyperglycemic? Do, do you know if that changes the interstitial fluid values? So it's been investigated and actually there have been a number of uh, studies looking using CGM in people undergoing surgery, people on intensive care units, even you know in closed loop studies, which I'm sure we'll get on to talk about, people have used that sense of glucose to drive insulin delivery. So there's a fair degree of confidence okay. around those numbers um, where they are. I think the key thing to remember is um, in someone in hospital it might be a, a kind of conservative or fallback position might be to make sure you have a couple of couple of readings through the day yeah. and that gives you a feel whether that particular sense is on song or not because there is this error and although you know maybe 95% of the readings are going to be pretty close there's always the potential for you to get a reading that's erroneous. Now looking at the data published data it's very unusual for that number to be so far out that it would make a significant difference to your decision. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the number not being the same and then there's whether that makes a difference to your decision making. Um, but on the whole we can trust those quite well and if there's any doubt you, you've yeah. got your fallback here. So although the clinician may not be familiar with this continuous glucose monitoring system, obviously there's going to be a great comfort for the person to continue to have that on there because one of the things that they may have attached to that, of course, are high and low glucose alarms, yeah. which for someone laying in a hospital bed can really give them a lot of confidence. Absolutely, yeah.